Well, General, your job's a defence of Europe, and the question I'd like to put to you is how the development of the North Atlantic Treaty Organisation, so far as your command is concerned, has gone, what its strength is and its strength, and in particular, if you'd tell us what you feel will be your main problems in the future. I'm delighted, Mr. Bullock. As you know, General Eisenhower came to France in January 1951 in order to set up our headquarters shape near Paris. Those initials stand for Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe. We now have two and a half headquarters some 400 officers from the 12 NATO nations. Two nations, Iceland having no armed forces and Portugal belonging to another command. Our job is to prepare defense plans for the defense of Europe. And we feel that those officers united in this common project have made tremendous progress in that two and a half year. Now as regards the forces themselves, when General Eisenhower came to Europe, those forces were at a very low ebb. And now I'm happy to be able to report that they're at least twice as strong from a numerical standpoint, and when it comes to effectiveness, they are at least three times as strong as they were at that time. That applies particularly to air forces, which were very, very weak when General Eisenhower came to Europe. I'd like to show you the extent of our command from the map. It begins at the tip of Norway and extends over a 4,000 mile perimeter to the eastern borders of Turkey. To facilitate command, there are four major commands. The first one at Oslo under General Manser, a British officer. The Central Command under Marshal Jouin at Fontainebleau. At Naples, we have our Southern Command to cover Italy, Greece, and Turkey under Admiral Fechtler, an American naval officer. And then for the protection of the entire Mediterranean, we have a Fourth Command at Malta under Admiral Mountbatten. Now, all of those commanders know exactly what to do if an emergency should develop today. Their plans are completely ready. I've said that our plans are ready. This does not necessarily mean that we have sufficient force in order to resist an act of aggression. I can assure you, however, that our troops would give a very gallant account of themselves. We still feel that we have additional forces to obtain, and we recognize that those will impose a terrific burden on the member countries of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. We feel, however, that if the people of the North Atlantic Treaty countries understand that our objective is peace, they will make the necessary sacrifices. It may seem strange, that a man in military uniform should be advocating peace. But we, who have had experience with war, recognize that it will settle nothing. And we are feel that our main objective is to prevent this war from taking place. We cannot, we have tried to negotiate to preserve peace from weakness. And in that effort, we have seen almost half of the free world disappear into the Soviet darkness. We must have strength in order to give our politicians, our statesmen, a firm basis from which to negotiate. We have tried negotiating from weakness, and in that endeavor, we have seen almost half of the free world disappear into the Soviet darkness. We must be able to have a position of military strength in order to give our statesmen a firm basis with which to negotiate with the USSR. That is our objective, which is another way of stating that we are trying to achieve peace in this world. Having seen this effort develop, 
having seen the sacrifices which the people of the North Atlantic Treaty countries have been willing to make, I am certain that they will continue to make the necessary effort in order to achieve this objective for which we have all dedicated our lives, namely peace, the preservation of which is the most essential object in the world today.